Uh, the title of this talk is Hybrid uh, STM-HTM for Nested Transactions on the OpenJDK. This is uh, work that was done with uh, Tony Hosking and Elliot Moss from UMass. So uh, first of all, I'll start with the motivation. So STM has been around for ages, but the problem with STM has been that STM is too slow to use in practice. Uh, and also we've seen a rise in commodity hardware supporting hardware transactional memory. But one problem with all these implementations of HTM is that they are only best effort. That, that is that if you're going to use HTM in practice, you need something to fall back on. And that's when an STM implementation comes into play. So the goal of this paper is to how to accelerate STM when you can get some hardware transactions going through in HTM. Uh, there are various kinds of, tran uh, of transactions. Notably, one is nested transactions, where you can compose bigger transactions by, by composing together a lot, lots of smaller transactions. And there are two main flavors of nested transactions, namely closed nested transactions and open nested transactions. Now, the main difference between these two is what happens at the point of commit. When a closed nested transaction commit, the child's reads and writes get appended to the parent's log, and the writes get visible to the other transactions only when the parent commits. But rather in open nesting, when a child transaction commits, the writes are made, uh, the writes are made, are made, made visible immediately at the cost of acquiring what is called an abstract lock and logging your undo operations. So that is the main difference between closed nesting and open nesting. And when you think about it, it would, it would make sense that in, in the closed nested sense, having a HTM transaction inside of a STM transaction doesn't really make sense. Because when the HTM transaction commits, it's going to make its rights visible to the world. And there is no way that you can the outside transaction can unroll it. If it was to unroll it, then this the SHTM transaction would also have to log everything in software. So it doesn't make sense in a closed nested setting to have HTM inside of STM. But when you're running open nested, the story is completely different. Because the inner transaction makes its rights visible to the world immediately, it makes sense to run the inner transaction in hardware, and you compose the outer transactions in software. So that is what we try to do in this work. So a system XJ, uh, which is a language uh, for Java for uh, expressing transactions. You can express transactions as flat uh, or closed nested with, uh, uh, with uh, closed nesting, open nesting, or boosted transactions. And the implementation uh, supports HTM transaction using the Intel PSX instruction set. And the, uh, one of the notable features is that we allow HTM and STM transactions to coexist in the sense that if you have two transactions running concurrently, one could be running in HTM, another could be running in STM, and they could be operating on the same object. And the system guarantees that the transaction semantics are met between these two transactions. Uh, we also use a optimistic write and uh, optimistic read and a pessimistic write protocol. So as we are dealing with STM, we need to keep some metadata. And the way we do it is we keep the metadata uh, in a word for every object. So every object has an extra word. Uh, and this word keeps track of two pieces of information with the least significant bit indicating the mode of operation. So it either keeps the version number of the object, or in the, uh, in the case of somebody has locked the object, you have the transaction ID of the transaction that locked the object. And for tracking the reads and writes, you have a transaction log to go with the STM implementation. So the way uh, a read works is when you want to do a read, you first uh, check the least significant bit and check to see whether the object is locked. If the object is not locked, at that point, you can take a copy of the version that the object is in and proceed to your other operations in the transaction. When you want to commit, you first need to do a validation, which is you check the version you read against the version of the current version of the object. And if that validation succeeds, at that point, you can commit. For the write, it's somewhat similar. So first, you check the least significant bit again to see whether the object is locked. If it's not locked, you record the version, the previous version of the object, 
and you put in your transaction ID into the object, also setting the least significant bit to one, to one setting that it's in lock mode, and the transaction ID. Now this needs to be a CAS operation because uh, it needs to go in automatically, so you need to do a CAS at this point. And when you need to commit, what you do is you increase the version number by one and put it in the uh, header word. This does not necessarily need to be a CAS because you have ownership of the object. So you need one CAS operation for each write. Uh, so let's see how this conflict, how the STM detects conflicts when there are two operations. So the read read case, there are no conflicts because it's the same version number. I'll, I'll show you a, a, a read and a write case. So imagine thread one reads this object, thread two then does a write to this object. So you see the transaction ID of uh, thread two going into the object. Now at this point, it, if T1 wants to commit, it's going to try to validate this, uh, validate the logs. And at that point, it's going to detect that the version that it has does not match the current header in the object. And at that point, T1 is going to abort, and T2 can continue along. So for the STM side of the side of things, everything is tied onto this lock word. Now, how does this work in the face of HTM? HTM, HTM conflicts, you don't have to worry about. That's taken care by the hardware. That, you don't need to do anything for that. But you need to handle STM and HTM conflicts. And the way we do it is we hang everything on this lock word. So when the HTM tries to read or write to an object, the first thing it's going to do is, again, check to see whether the object is locked. If it's locked, it's going to ex abort the transaction explicitly by calling the exabort instruction. But so every operation first reads this object header. And for an HTM read, you don't need to do anything else specific. All that you're doing is reading this object header. If an STM transaction goes ahead and does a write, that would cause this HTM transaction to abort itself. Right? The hardware would abort this transaction because another thread has done a write. But uh, during a write, what we do for the HTM case is you immediately incre increment the version number. So the way that works is, now imagine there's another software transaction running. If it had done a read, then incrementing this version number would have invalidated that read it did. Also, if there was another hardware transaction running concurrently, incrementing this version number would have invalidate, invalidated that read as well, right? So for the read case, we just read the metadata word. For the write case, we increment the, vers uh, the version number in the metadata word. So, that's the way the physical locking works, but what about the abstract locking? So I mentioned that in open nested transactions, when the nested transaction commits, you release all the physical level locks, but you need to grab abstract locks. There's something interesting going on with, uh, with, the, with that as well. So in a classical sense for an STM, you first acquire the abstract locks, you execute your method body, and then you release the locks if it's a top level transaction. Uh, if it's a nested transaction, you acquire the abstract logs, and then at commit point, you need to lock the abstract logs along with the undo operations. But can we do better in the case of a uh, hybrid transaction? When we are running a hybrid transaction, you can do some optimizations only if the top level is HTM. If the top level is STM, it becomes a little bit tricky. So if the top level is HTM, instead of acquiring and logging the abstract locks in the nested transactions, what you can do is you can simply validate the abstract locks. And the, actually, this optimization is necessary because if you go ahead and do that, imagine there's two hardware transactions, uh, both doing a read-only transaction. Now, acquiring this abstract lock is actually performing a write operation on the abstract lock data structure. So if you have two open nested transactions running in hardware, they can actually cause a conflict because of m mutating the abstract data, lo uh, abstract locking data structure. So in, in to get mitigate that, what we do is we just do a validation of the, of the lock, uh, abstract locks. But does this really work? So there are two cases. One is HTM versus STM, and the other is HTM versus HTM. So in the HTM versus STM, the argument is that software always goes and acquires the lock, right? And that causes some write operations 
on the abstract locking data structure. What HTM does is HTM goes and validates the lock, which means it's going to read some, some memory words of the abstract, abstract locking data structure. And if there was some conflict at the abstract level, then there would have been some conflict at the physical level in the abstract locking data structure, and that would cause the HTM transaction to invalidate itself. HTM versus HTM is a little more subtle because what you're doing is you're just validating the abstract lock and both uh, hardware transactions are only doing a read on the abstract lock data structure. So they don't detect the conflict at the point of validating the abstract lock. Rather, the, the idea is that if there was a conflict at the abstract level, then there would have been a conflict at the physical level definitely in the actual data structure that you're, that you're playing around with. So then the HTM would have detected the conflict at that stage and aborted one, one of it. So. so with that, I'll go into some implementation details. So we've seen that STM obviously needs to handle login. The hardware method doesn't. There are different actions that need to be run when an object is read, whether when you are STM, you need to do things in a different way rather than being HTM. The abstract locking protocols are different for HTM and STM. And when HTM fails, it should always be able to fall back to STM. And what it really means is that you could have one method for each of these, but then if you want to do it that way, then you'll have to have a lot of if-else statements all over the code. So instead, what we do is we maintain two, two separate versions of the method, one for when to use when running in HTM, and the other to use when running in STM. And I'll just go through some of the transitions that these methods go through. So um, imagine you're running in STM. So an original method in this sense is, uh, what I'm showing here is types of method. It's just a non-transactional method. So non-transactional methods can make calls into other non-transactional methods. And the notation I'm using here is, if there's a solid arrow from A to B, that means methods of type A can call methods of type B. Now, if you want to create a transaction, this non-transactional method has to make, in a, make a call into a top-level transaction, a method of a type of a top-level transaction. And that would need to make calls into non-transactional methods. And in that case, you need a version of the method that has suitable instrumentation for tracking the transaction. So those methods can make calls into other methods of the same type. But what happens if you want to create another level of nesting? At that point, you have a new nested uh, version of the method that creates a new nested transaction. And that version of the method can create more nested transactions, right? as well as talk into other versions of the non-transactional methods. And to complete the graph, uh, non-transactional versions of the method can make uh, nested transactions as well, right? And what about, now this is if you are having just STM in play, but how can you integrate HTM into this? Things get a lot more trickier. So you have the original non-transactional versions of the method, but when you want to create a transaction, what do you do? Do you create a hardware transaction or a software transaction? Well, to handle that, we call into what we call the router method. The router method can either create a software transaction or a hardware transaction. So that's a synthetic method that's generated into the code that decides on whether to run this transaction in hardware or software. If you create a hardware transaction, then you call into non-transactional versions of the method that has instrumentation for the hardware version, as well as create new nested transactions. Now you'd notice here that I call that optimized nested transaction the sense that the hardware implementation is, doesn't do true close nesting. It is all flat nested. So if you have a transaction running inside of another transaction, for hardware, it just looks as one big transaction. So there is no point in creating a new level of nesting and putting in all machinery to track the new nested level. So you can create an optimized version of the method for that. And the top level transaction may call into creating more nested transaction. What about the software side of the story? So for the STM, again, you can call into the original versions of the method. And, but 
how do you create a new nested transaction? Now at that point, it really depends on the context. It depends whether your top level is closed or open. If the top level is closed, then at this point, you create a new software transaction. But if the top level is open, at that point, you go into a new router method, which can either send you off into software or hardware. right? And what is interesting is that once you're in hardware, you're always in hardware. You don't come to software, but once you're in software, you can go back to hardware if your parent, if, if your parent is open. So that's the interesting thing in this case. So all that, all those kinds of methods are handled behind the curtain by by the XJ arch, uh, system. So you start off with XJ source code. You give it to the XJ compiler, which is an extended version of Java C. It generates standard bytecode. At runtime you instrument all the code to generate all those method variants, and you run it against uh, HTM-enabled JVM. Now, and HTM transactions are actually four to five times faster than STM. What is this HTM-enabled JVM? We've kept the, the changes to a minimum. We've modified OpenJDK with native methods to begin a transaction, end a transaction, and abort a transaction and we've implemented them in the hotspot compiler as JVM intrinsic. So you don't pay the overhead of J and I to uh, execute these instructions. Uh, we had to go through a lot of hoops to get HTM to work uh, with the hotspot optimizing compilers. Uh, I'm not going into details here. The details are in the paper. Uh, and we've explored some solutions in a paper we presented at VMIL as well. So with that, I'll get into some results. The benchmarks we ran were uh, based on SynchroBench. So SynchroBench is a micro benchmark suite for evaluating the performance of various synchronization techniques. Uh, we extended it with one added capability that you can run transactions of various sizes and uh, including the XJ versions of the benchmarks. The results that I'm showing are based on the uh, transaction friendly tree set. And we run this machine, these experiments on a 48-way machine which has uh, two sockets of 12 hyperthreaded cores. So two sockets, 12 cores each, uh, 48 hardware threads in total. Uh, so I'm showing all the results for uh, per update percentage of 5%. On the left-hand side, you see a closed nesting, right-hand side, open nesting. Uh, it's all normalized to uh, uh, serial performance per node. So uh, if it's a horizontal line, that means it's perfect scaling. And the drop-offs you see here is at 24. That's when you start using the hyperthreads. And we run the benchmark so that we pin all the threads to cores so, so that uh, we can control how the threads are allocated. So at 12 threads, you cross the boundary of a core. At 24 threads, you start going into hyperthreads. And that's when you see the severe drop-off in HTM, which uh, is to do with, uh, at that point, you start sharing the buffers and the size of your transaction that you can accommodate seriously drops. So this is for uh, running one transaction. Uh, so this is two transactions nested inside of one transaction. So at transaction one, the, op the overhead that open nesting pays is high. But as you start increasing the transaction size, you see the performance of open nesting going up and the performance of closed nesting going down. Because at that point, closed nesting is now totally running in software. It cannot run in hardware because the transactions are just too big to fit in hardware. But open nesting keeps running in hardware. And we can see this very clearly with this graph. So this is showing total numbers of, of uh, aborts, commits, what went through HTM and what went through STM. I'm showing it for group size one, two, and four. The pattern just keeps continuing. So you see at group size one, you see a lot of transactions going through in hardware, which, which is in the darker blue. And only a little of them fall back to software. When you group, go to group size two, the story starts changing a bit for closed nesting. You see like equal percentages between hardware and software. But when you go to group size four, almost nothing in hardware. You're running exclusively in software. Whereas with open nesting, you see that across the board, you keep using the hardware transactions. You don't, you don't need to necessarily fall back to software. You only start to fall back to software when you go beyond 24 threads. That's when hyperthreading kicks in, 
and your hardware transaction memory performance goes down. So un if you have enough hardware threads with, with full access to the buffers, then open nesting does really well. So in conclusion, I showed you uh, the XJ where STM and HTM transactions uh, can coexist with each other. Uh, the schemes used for closed nesting is similar to previous uh, schemes, but with open nesting, there is uh, novel uh, validation mechanisms for the abstract locks and the physical locks and how HTM and STM can coexist with each other. The implementation is on OpenJDK based on Intel TSX instructions. We've shown that when it works, HTM is four to five times faster. The tricky thing is to get it to work. And to get it to work, you need to uh, decompose your transactions properly. Uh, and open nesting increases the effectiveness for HTM, whereas you can't get the benefits when you're using closed nesting. Uh, the moral of the story with uh, having to trick the compilers in hotspot is that a production VM needs a lot more deeper VM modifications. The VM modifications we did, we kept at a minimal, but we had to, instead of modifying the compilers, we had to trick the compiler a lot to get it to work. Uh, yeah, thank you.